Hello and welcome to Virtual Longmire Days. My name is Craig Johnson. I'm the author of the Walt Longmire Mystery Series, um, which is also the basis uh, for the television show Longmire. And um, what we're having this year is a virtual Longmire Days. Like it, and uh, it's it's actually turned out to be a number of challenges, but also a number of a number of absolutely wonderful rewards. Um, we've been getting an awful lot of emails and a lot of a lot of messages from people who. Um, I guess, you know, it, it didn't occur to me how many people, you know, would want to come to Longmire Days that really didn't have the chance. Like it, and it's been absolutely heartwarming uh, to hear the responses and uh, to, to have all of the people say, you know, just how nice it is to have these events, you know, on the Internet. It also kind of shows a, a glaring fault that we might have had for the last nine years in that uh, this was probably something that we should have been doing for the last nine years. <laughs> and I do apologize for that. Like that but um, I, I guess in my only defense, uh, there's a reason why it is that my protagonist, Walt Longmire, uh, doesn't carry a cell phone like that. I, I don't carry a cell phone an awful lot of the time. And if, if it wasn't for writing the books, I probably wouldn't go near a computer in my entire life. Like I actually started my writing career up on a mechanical typewriter, which is at the moment um, actually on display at the Jim Gatchel Museum. Uh, in Buffalo, like that with a very large Longmire uh, exhibit that they have, um, which they're going to extend um, through this year, as a matter of fact. Like I said, for those of you who are planning on coming to our 10th anniversary of Longmire Days next year, um, you do have that to look forward to, like at the, the uh, Jim Gatchel Museum, which is actually the old Carnegie Library right behind the courthouse here in Johnson County and is actually Walt Longmire's office. Um, that exhibit will still be up like that. And uh, we've been getting all kinds of responses from the actors and um, from a number of uh, other luminaries like that that are going to be here for the 10th anniversary. And we're very excited about it like that. But right now we're very excited about virtual Longmire Days. It's been kind of wonderful to see the response um, to all the events like that. And uh, I guess I'm inviting you to, to join me, you know, for the next hour like that. Um, it's not going to be much of a Zoom panel. Like it's going to be me alone talking about the book that's coming out um, November 22nd. You know, but to uh, kick things off, I'm actually going to read something from another author, as a matter of fact. Like that. And, uh, you know, I'll tell you what, like that, if he wasn't of the caliber that he is, I would be just a little bit jealous like that. But uh, here it is. George Custer was not an intelligent leader of cavalry, Robert, his grandfather had said. He was not even an intelligent man. He remembered when his grandfather said that, he felt resentment that anyone could speak against the figure in the buckskin shirt, the yellow curls blowing, that stood on the hill holding a service revolver as the Sioux closed in around him and the old Anheuser-Busch lithograph that hung on the pool room wall in Red Lodge, Montana. He just had a great ability to get himself in and out of trouble, his grandfather went on. And on the little bighorn, he got into it, but couldn't get out. That's from, from whom the bell tolls. Um, our good friend, uh, Ernest Hemingway, uh, page 388, if you want to try and look it up there. Um, it's kind of interesting like that because Hemingway actually mentions, you know, Custer a couple of different times in his later works. Like, and uh, I'm sure it's that, you know, that, that lost cause, you know, kind of aspect that appealed. Uh, to Hemingway like that, but I found it very interesting that he actually mentioned um, the one item that is kind of like the kickoff point um, for the book that's coming out September 22nd, the next to last stand. And uh, I'm going to talk about that a little bit here today. Like that, I guess um, a couple of things first, like that I have to admit that like, you know, whenever you approach a novel, you know, there are lots of different layers, you know, a lot of stratums of, uh, of information that you're trying to, you know, compose and put inside there. And you know, for me, one of the big things, you know, a lot of Western history to try and include in the books, and especially in a, a very you know, magnificent time period as we have today, like that, where there are so many people who are producing amazing um, works, you know, nonfiction historical works that kind of give us a new perspective, you know, on a lot of like tried and true um, subject matters, you know, of the American West. And boy, you know, one of the monsters, you know, of, uh, of, of American Western history, you know, has to be the little bighorn, um, has to be uh, Custer, has to be Sitting Bull, Crazy Horse, all of that, like that, and there have been so many books written about it, so many movies made, you know, so much done, like that. And I gotta admit that, that after you know all the research that I've done over the last couple of years, actually for a number of years, like that, um, 
there are a lot of bad books out there about Custer and the Little Bighorn, and there's a, a lot of really bad movies that have been made also. Look at, and, uh, but anyway, the, 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 the breadth and width of information like that that has to be taken into account whenever you try and approach something like that, as far as the research is concerned, a lot of times I tend to look at it almost like a mountain. Um, and so I guess I looked at the little bighorn and uh, the parties involved as being this mountain that at some point in time, I was probably going to climb like that because it's only 90 minutes up the road like that. And I've been there, you know, at the battlefield numerous times. I've actually um, spoken, you know, to a lot of really, you know, wonderful historians like that. And also tribal members who's like, you know, great, great grandfathers actually fought um, on either the Cheyenne or the Sioux or the Crow um, on the sides uh, of, the, of the, the native aspect of, uh, of the, the Little Bighorn. And so uh, all of this information was swimming around in my head like that. And I thought, okay, one of these days I'm going to take a crack at it like that. But then whenever you're thinking about something like that, the difficulty is always going to be, well, you know, what's going to be your access point? You know, what is it that's going to make you, you know, that's going to make this something new? I mean, I didn't want to just you know, do some kind of a book where they did a reenactment and somebody was killed and Walt was, you know, called in, you know, that, that would be kind of predictable. Like, so I started thinking about it, what it was that would make it, you know, more interesting, you know, an access point, you know, to that history that would make it more enjoyable and unique, something, something new to say, like that, about, you know, the Little Bighorn and all these combatants. And uh, I remember like, that, that um, I had read that, you know, that, that sequence that was actually in um, For Whom the Bell Tolls, like at where he mentions the Anheuser-Busch uh, you know, painting that was on the wall or the posters that were sent out sometimes to the tune of almost a million a year. Like it um, was kind of interesting to me. Like that. And then I stumbled onto a really wonderful book of essays. Um, by an author by the name of Norman McLean, like that, who, if you don't know, you should. Um, a very wonderful author who wrote a magnificent book called A River Runs Through It. Um, I think Robert Redford made an absolutely marvelous film, um, but the book is unsurpassed. It's an absolutely one of the most beautiful books um, I've ever read. And uh, he also wrote another book called Young Men and Fire. Um, he was an amazing author from up in Montana um, and an amazing teacher, um, which I think cut into the, uh, the amount of books that he wrote, which is tragic like that, but I'm sure a lot of his students you know, went on to produce wonderful things too like that. But he did this book of essays and in one of the essays, I think he was doing research where he was toying with the idea of actually doing a book about, um, about Custer. And, uh, I, you know, he actually included, you know, a certain amount of information that was involved um, with the Anheuser-Busch, the Cassili Adams painting um, called Custer's Last Fight. Now, to tell you about the book, um, I guess, you know, what I have to do <laughs> is give you a brief history of, of, in art, uh, in this particular piece of art. Um, what happened was, is about maybe eight years you know, after the Battle of the Little Bighorn in 1876, um, 1854, a, an author by the name of Cassili Adams um, did a painting. And I guess at that point in time, one of the things that was um, very popular was to do huge paintings of historic events. Um, you have to remember this was a period in time when there was no 24 uh, hour news cycle, seven days a week, that there were no, there were no news reels. There was really, really nothing. You know, I mean, other than newspapers, like get to rely on. And they were somewhat limited, like that, as far as like the woodcuts that they could use or, you know, the tin types or things like that, that was kind of rudimentary as far as these things were concerned. So these authors would paint these paintings, these monstrously huge paintings. And then what they would do is they would send these paintings out on the road in these wagons. They would light them like that, and then charge people two bits. You'd pay your quarter um, to go in like that and actually you know, see this properly lit painting. And the painting that uh, Cassili Adams had done, he's an, uh, an, uh, an artist from uh, St. Louis. Um, he did this painting that was about nine and a half feet by 16 and a half. With, and it was a triptych. It was a huge painting in the center and had two end pieces. Um, and so uh, this thing went on tour. It went all over the country like that and finally made it back to St. Louis. And when they got back to St. Louis, they couldn't figure out what to do with it, you know, because it was so large. Um, there were galleries and everything that really didn't know, you know, where to put it or what to do with it because it was so large. Well, there was an enterprising saloon owner uh, not too far from the train station there in St. Louis. And, uh, and I think it was uh, about, let's see, I'm trying to think of what the years were. Um, I believe it was like no more than maybe two years after that. So it must have been um, some time like at, I guess, in the you know, 1890s, I guess, 1880s, 1890s, um, that the painting was sold. 
and the painting was sold look at to this uh, saloon owner and he puts it up on his wall okay he puts it up on the wall of the saloon there um, in st louis like and there it hangs you know for a number of years and then what happened which is you know sometimes what happens with these type of uh of, of establishments they they went bankrupt they went out of business like that and lost uh, uh their, their business like that and um one of their greatest creditors at that point in time was a then small brewery based out of St. Louis by the name of Anheuser-Busch. And so Augie Bush, you know, comes down from uh, the, the brewery, walks down the street, goes into the saloon, looks at him and says, you owe me $30,000 for all the beer. You know, what are you going to do to pay me? And, you know, they said, we're bankrupt. We don't have any money. Like it. And so Augie Bush, you know, always an enterprising individual, looks around in the saloon, spots the painting up on the wall and says, I'll take the painting. So they take the painting off of the wall, they roll it up, look at Augie Bush walks back up to the brewery with this thing under his arm. He rolls it out on this big orchard table there in the brewery and says, um, we are gonna make posters. We're gonna make posters and prints of this painting. And we're gonna send them out to every saloon, every bar, every restaurant, every serviceman um, in the United States military. And by the time we're through with this promotion, by golly, we're gonna be a lot bigger brewery than we are now. And boy, did it work. Um, Budweiser became the largest national brewer, not only in the United States, but also in the world. And this painting became the most viewed painting in American history. And one of the statements that I think was absolutely marvelous um, that uh, Norman McLean said that it was the most viewed by questionably inebriated art critics uh, more than any other uh, piece of artwork in American history. And so this thing hang, hung on everybody's walls, like in all these bars, all these, they had like little black, they, the one that I've got right here, I can show you an example of it right here. Um, you can see it. Um, I, I, I bought this, I didn't like yank it off the wall in some bar somewhere, you know, and drag it home. I just want to be clear about that. Um, I actually purchased this one like that. And uh, anyway, like you can see uh, the painting here, like it, and I've also got a talk coming up later on with Jeremy Johnson from over at the Buffalo Bill Museum, like that we had a wonderful conversation where he talks about the historical inaccuracies that are in kind of involved and innate with this particular painting like that. But I'm not gonna get into that this, this day particularly. I'll, I'll save that information for later on. But you can see right down here, Custer's last fight, and you can see the Budweiser trade mark that was on here and the way that the, the this particular version was made it was folded flat like that but then once you got it you folded it out and it made this you know this cardboard um you know frame you know so that you could hang it on the wall of the bar like that and of course i mean it's not particularly high quality because you know a lot of the the ones that i've seen as a matter of fact they have a beautiful um, uh, a lithograph over at the Buffalo Bill, which was one of the originals from, I think, the, the turn of the century. And it's got beer stains, you know, across it. So you, this is just, you know, stock and trade you know, for this particular type um, of artwork. Okay. But um, anyway, uh, you know, they were putting out about a million of these posters a year and uh, cranking them out, like getting, sending them out all over the, you know, not only the, the country, but all over the world. And uh, finally, like, uh, you know, after a certain period of time, I think it was 1934, I believe it was, um, Augie Bush looked around and said, you know what, we've made enough posters, we've made enough money off of this particular, you know, uh, piece of artwork, you know, let's do something philanthropic with it. And so in a fit of philanthropic zeal, like that, they turned around and gave the painting, uh, all nine and a half feet by 16 and a half foot of it, uh, to the 7th Cavalry, which at that point in time um, was based in Fort Bliss, Texas. And so they shipped it off, you know, to them, like it, and uh, before it got shipped off to them, I think it was sent to the Boston Conservancy, like it, and the Works Project Act, uh, the Works Project Association, where they, they, they cleaned it all up, you know, and brightened the colors, you know, and worked on it a little bit, like it, and then shipped it off to Fort Bliss in Texas, like it, for the 7th Cavalry's headquarters, where it was hung in the commissary. Uh, it was hung in the officer's mess, the commissary, up on the wall, it took up the whole wall, and it hung there until 1946 when the commissary burned to the ground and the painting was destroyed. Or was it? Uh, there lies uh, the crux of uh, the next Walt Longmire mystery novel, uh, The Next to Last Stand. What if that painting wasn't destroyed? What if um, it survived that fire? And so for me, it was interesting to go around and maybe ask some questions and find out, you know, what kind of like, you know, social impact 
um, that painting had. Um, it was not only a question of the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the the financial value, you know, of the painting itself, like that, but also the social value of it. The fact that it had probably been viewed by more Americans than any other piece of artwork in American history. Like it, and so I I asked different people. I asked down at the Jim Gatchell. I asked over the Bradford Britain over in Sheridan County. I asked, you know, over there at the the uh, the Buffalo Bill Center of the West. Like that, and generally the consensus was that the painting would probably be worth at least twenty four to twenty five million dollars and uh, you know whenever you start talking about a million here and a million there pretty soon you're talking about some serious money as they used to say like that and um, it seemed like something that might up the ante enough to make it interesting uh, as an art heist book that this would be something a little bit different you know than Walt had ever dealt with before um, then of course the question becomes like you know well when how is this gonna have an effect on the sheriff of Absaroka County you know how is it going to become you know, part of, uh, you know, of his job, you know, to have to deal with this situation like that. And uh, that was another key component, you know, in the storyline for me. Um, just outside of Buffalo, you know, here in Johnson County, um, we have the Soldier and Sailor's Home. And uh, I still refer to it as the Soldier and Sailor's Home. A lot of the old timers here, um, we still, you know, refer to it, you know, as the Soldier and Sailor's Home, but it's now called the Wyoming Veterans Home. And uh, it's where, you know, the veterans can go and reside, look at in their golden years, look at in the latter parts of their lives, look at. And uh, one of the things that was very, very interesting to me when I was building my ranch, you know, here about 25 years ago or so, there were these group of guys called the waivers. And what they would do was they would sit out in front of the big sign um, there on uh, 16, which is, you know, the state route that goes um, through Buffalo, winds its way through Buffalo, and then goes up. Uh, up the mountain into the Bighorn Mountains like that. And so they would sit out there in front of the sign in their wheelchairs and they would just wave, you know, at the traffic, at the people going by. And it was always to me, you know, kind of like, you know, heartwarming to see those guys out there. And I would stop. I would, you know, I got curious. Like I got kind of curious because I thought, you know what, I bet those guys have some stories. Like, you know, and as an author, that's probably my weakness. Like if somebody says I've got a story, then I, I'm pretty well planted. You know, I, I like to hear those stories. An awful lot of the best books that I've done, an awful lot of the best stories that I've included, you know, have generally had, you know, stories from a lot of different people like that have just taken the time to sit down and tell me some of them. You know, sometimes I'll use bits and pieces of them. Sometimes I'll use the entirety of them. But I just thought, you know what, those guys probably have some stories to tell. Like, and so I would pull up in my pickup truck, like after going and getting lumber, you know, uh, at Buckingham's, like at, or, you know, at Ace Hardware or whatever, like at Wheel Up and Stop, like at, and just, you know, get out and sit on the tailgate there and talk with those guys. Like, at, and they had extraordinary experience just to talk about. I mean, at that period in time, there were still veterans like that from World War II um, that would sit and talk, you know, about the experiences that they had. Um, and then there were the Korean veterans like that. And then now the Vietnam veterans like that, that would sit and talk with me. And uh, they would always try and get me to bring them beer. Like that. And uh, I, I talked to some people down there and they said, no, those guys have, you know, meds that they're supposed to take. And if they try and take those, you know, along with beer, that might cause some problems like that. And so I, I didn't bring them beer like a Walt does, you know, in the books like that. But uh, it's a little bit safer world sometimes between the, uh, the covers of the books. Like that. And so um, anyway, like that, I started thinking about it. And I, I asked at the Johnson County Sheriff's Department, I said, you know, I, it's a good friend of mine, Larry Kirkpatrick, who was the sheriff there a number of years ago look at and I asked Larry I said do you ever have any kind of interactions or any doings up there you know at the at the uh, at the veterans home and he goes oh yeah yeah a lot of times like I was like well what what exactly do you have to deal with and he goes well Craig a lot of those guys are ex-military like you know and they've got some of their treasures you know kind of tucked away and so if one of them passes away you know we'll get a call like that to come up like at you know, they, they will have started going through, you know, their foot lockers, you know, and sometimes they'll find, you know, weapons or armaments or things like that, that they've had tucked away like that, you know, and you don't know what quality these, what kind of state, you know, these weapons are in or the ammunition or anything like that. So they, they need to be taken care of or disposed of, you know, whatever it is that needs to be done. And so that got me to thinking. That got me to thinking, okay, well, what if one individual in particular, you know, were to happen to pass away? up there at the soldier and sailor's home and Walt Longmire was called in and uh, got up there like that. And uh, this thing, you know, the dominoes just started falling and, and they discovered things that, you know, maybe didn't seem like they were quite right. That should have been there. Um, so for me, this was an opportunity like that. And so uh, it's a little bit of an opportunity for you too, like that, because if you don't mind what I'm going to do is give you a little bit of a reading 
uh, this afternoon. Like that. Now, I want to be very clear about this. Like that, the reading that I'm going to do um, is actually the reading that Robert Taylor uh, did uh, for our virtual Longmire days. Like that, if you haven't checked it out, we've got nine different readings from all of the different actors from the television show Longmire. And they all have like different snippets, you know, from um, uh, the next to last fight, or next to last, uh, uh, the next to last uh, fight. And for me, I have to be honest with you, like that, you know, it was kind of a, a revelation um, because, you know, I asked them to do this and they were kind enough, you know, to agree and to jump in and do it. But when, when you hear these performers perform, an awful lot of the time, like if they got one or two sentences or something um, in Longmire, like that they, you know, they really didn't have any like full page monologues or anything like that. And to hear them, you know, really be able to cut their teeth on these absolutely marvelous, uh, you know, readings where, you know, not, not, I'm not talking about the quality of the reading, I'm talking about the length of the readings. Like if they get an opportunity to read, you know, for pages, you really get a wonderful sense of just, you know, how wonderful the quality of what it is that, that they're capable of doing. And uh, of course, you know, since the books are written in first person, all of them had to pretend like they were Walt Longmire. And so uh, some of them were really hilarious. Like it was very funny to hear Luann Stevens, who played Ruby, um, pretend to be Walt Longmire. She did a magnificent job. As a matter of fact, if we were gonna do Walt Longmire again, I think we'd have to have maybe have uh, Luann Stevens maybe have a run at auditioning for the role of Walt Longmire. Okay. But um, they all did absolutely incredible jobs, really amazing jobs. Okay. So if you get a chance, head over, and I get a chance to listen to them. We also have a short story called um, uh, Musical Appreciation. Um, and for that one, we use the old grandmaster, uh, the, 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 the mini Audi winner. And, uh, you know, my goodness, how many audio books has he recorded? I guess more than you know, 1,500 audio books. Um, our good friend, George Guadal, like who does all of the audio books for me. So I'm, the only reason I'm including all this information is, is because you get a rank amateur today. I'm dreadfully sorry like that, but uh, you know, if you want to hear the professionals do the readings, you're going to have to switch over like to one of the other channels like that, but you're going to have to suffer with me like that uh, this afternoon. And this is actually from the beginning of uh, the next to last, uh, or from uh, the next to last uh, stand. And um, uh, hopefully you'll enjoy it. So hopefully I won't stumble over it too badly either. Turning in a circle and driving by the front opening of Fort McKinney, I glanced at the boys out enjoying the summer sun in front of the red brick sign, but was distinctly aware of a gap in the middle where a fifth electric wheelchair used to always sit, for all the world reminding me of the missing man aerial formation used by squadrons to salute a fallen comrade. I continued on toward one of the two remaining original buildings, the old Fort Hospital now serving as the visitor's house, and the other being an honest to goodness chicken shed that was on the National Register of Historic Places. I opened the other window a bit and then climbed out of the three-quarter ton truck, reaching back and stroking my sidekick and perennial ham finder on the head. I'll take you for a walk when I get back, okay? His big St. Bernard German Shepherd dire wolf eyes stared back at me. I will, honest, this shouldn't take that long. Closing the door, I walked toward the front entrance of the Dutch hip gable-style building and paused to take off my hat as I knocked on the door. At the flagpole to my left, a staff member was lowering the flag to half-mast. Inside, I walked by a wicker furniture and a, an abandoned mid-game checkerboard on a small table. I watched as the maintenance man tied off the flag near the AGM-28 Hound Dog air launch cruise missile that was the centerpiece of the fort's static museum. I stood there for a moment, saluting, when I heard footsteps approaching from behind and turned to find Carol Williams, who functioned as both caretaker and an administrator. The small woman with the silver hair leaned against one of the posts. You've been out there talking to the waivers? They gave me the lowdown on Charlie Lee. Did, you, did they still ask you to bring them beer? Every time. She shook her head. I'm sorry, Walt, but if the feds ever found out, that's all right. I'm not so sure I want them drinking and driving those aftermarket contraptions of theirs. Amazing, isn't it? It's a competition among them and they're hopping up the motors and using different tires on their wheelchairs. Delmar stole the motor out of one of the washing machines to try put in his. She sighed, boys. After a moment, she stood up on tiptoe, studying my face. I heard about it, but I hadn't seen it. That's some scar. Thanks. 
she crossed her arms. I think Charlie Lee was one of the last Korean War veterans we had. Moving on to Vietnam now. You trying to tell me something? She smiled. I just think about all the history that's being lost. When an old man dies, a library burns to the ground. Voltaire? I shook my head. An old African proverb. I held the door as she motioned for me to follow, and we ducked into the main building. We'll head over to Charlie Lee's room in a moment, but I'd like to show you something first. We walked down a short hallway hung with black and white photographs from a time when there was, was an actual fort. Charlie Lee leave a bazooka or a flamethrower in his foot locker? Something like that. She stopped at her office where Jean Weller, the security guard, stood at the door. Hi, Jean. Hey, Walt. Carol paused to pull out some keys and unlock her door. Having a security problem here at the fort? She gave me a knowing look, but I had no idea what it was that I was supposed to know. <laughs> Come on in. Her office was a small room with more photographs on the walls. There was a bookshelf of mostly military history crowned with a large handmade model of the USS Missouri and a very clean and orderly desk where, sitting on a leather blotter, looking somewhat out of place, was a large, battered, four-shime shoebox with a rubber band holding the lid closed. I stood in front of the desk looking down, my hands on my gun belt, and the web of my thumb resting on the hammer of my colt. So it's not bigger than a bread box. She sat in her chair, resting her elbows on the blotter, and laced her fingers to provide a cradle for her pointed chin. I take it you've already opened it? I have. It was on the top when we pulled out his footlocker. I secured the room, brought the box over here, and called you. I nodded, reaching down, gave her one last look, and then slid off the rubber band and flipped off the top. Inside was a white plastic grocery bag carefully wrapped around a symmetrical bundle that took up the whole box. I glanced at Carol again and then peeled the plastic away to reveal school. Scores of bills taped together in small bands. I withdrew one of the pocket packets after noting not only the number, but also the denomination. Hundreds? All of them. In bands of a hundred? Yes. I glanced at the box again to see if it was really completely full. How many packets? I haven't emptied it. By estimate from the size, I'd say a hundred. Peeling a bill from the packet in my hand, I held it up to the overhead light. I'm no expert, but it doesn't look counterfeit to me. Me either. She shook her head. You can see why I didn't go any further without you being present. Boy, howdy. I nudged the box with a forefinger. Any note in here? Receipt for deposit or withdrawal or anything? She shook her head slowly. Nothing that I saw, but then I didn't go all the way through after I saw what it was. I studied the stack about a half inch thick. Usually the bands have a bank name, but these are blank. I nudged the box as if poking it might get it to give out with some answers. No writing on the box? Forsheim, Midtown, Plain Toe, Zip Boot, Brown, size 12. She stood. Do you want to head over to his room? I stared at all the money. A cool million. Now you know why it is I called you. So, I returned the bill into the packet, reinserting it among its brethren, and then replacing the lid and the rubber band. 50-50? That's all you get today. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it. Um, the book comes out on September 22nd. Look at that. And, um, and I won't be touring. I'll get it for the first time in uh, 17 years. You know, I won't be out on tour. Um, but I will be doing a virtual tour. Like I, I think my publicist, Ben Patron, like at, back in New York, is actually watching this today. He maybe he's checking up on me to see if I'm, if I'm any good. Um, so if you guys would, be sure to leave me a good review like at, and tell everybody, you know, especially Ben, what a good job I did. Like at, at this point, normally what I do is open it up and allow you guys to ask some questions. And um, like I said, we'll be doing a, well, I should probably finish that statement first. Like we'll be doing a virtual tour um, come the 22nd, like for about a week or so, like at what I think about a dozen different stops. And I'm looking forward to it too. Like it's always fun um, to be out on the road, even if it's just the virtual road. So anyway, at this point in time, I've got a little screen over here to my right. 
and um, it tells me, you know, uh, the, uh, the questions, you know, that people might have. Um, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask, I see there's all kinds of absolutely wonderful responses, like getting wonderful statements from everybody. Thank you so much. Like we've got people coming from all over the place, Australia, from France, from Indonesia, um, from all over the, the world. Like, and uh, thank you so much. But if anybody does have any questions, you know, that you'd like to ask, now would be the time for you to jump in. I'm gonna kind of, you know, scroll through here and see which ones that I can find um, to answer like that. And um, I'll try and give you a little bit of um, a response to that. Um, somebody just said, oh yeah, that, you know, that, that painting is actually uh, in the local bar um, right here across the street from me. And I've seen it numerous, numerous times like it. And uh, yeah, it's, it's one of those things, you know, that I've, you know, I've, I've seen, you know, everywhere. Um, it doesn't matter where you go, like that, you're going to see that thing hanging on the wall, like that. You know, uh, Anheuser Busch did a, a very good job of of, uh, of covering the entire nation, like at in different points of the globe, um, and getting it across, like that, to, uh, to to everybody, so that we could all see this, like it. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of inconsistencies that are involved with the painting. Um, one of the ones that was kind of interesting to me, like that, and I'm always looking for, you know, whenever it's something interesting, was that um, there there are a number of inconsistencies as far as the, the actuality is concerned. First of all, in the painting, like at, um, the geography is a little bit wrong. The village is on the wrong side. Um, and, you know, uh, Custer has long hair. He had cut his hair before the Battle of the Little Bighorn the night before. Um, he's swinging a saber and the 7th Cavalry were not issued sabers um, for that particular action. Um, and then uh, the the warriors, like at, I, I think probably Cassili Adams, like, at, you know, had um, plenty of, you know, soldiers that were there in St. Louis, you know, that could come in and he could, they could pose for him and take a look at, you know, what it was he was doing, like, and he could look and see their equipment and their uniforms, you know, and, um, you know, he got that pretty, pretty well. He actually did a pretty good job with the soldiers. The Indians he did a horrible job with, I've got to say, like, um, they look like a combination, you know, between, uh, Zulu warriors and uh, Seminoles, you know, from out of Florida or something. Um, they they look really kind of strange. Like at, um, they're they're carrying these like giant turtle shields. It looks like like they, and uh, I was curious about that, and uh, it was interesting. Like at, because when I was talking to Jeremy Johnston, uh, the historian over at the Buffalo Bill. He said at that point in time, that was the time of Rourke's Drift, like in the time of the Zulu uprisings in Africa, um, which was only, you know, like maybe about 10 years or so after the Little Bighorn. And so um, that, that it had a large scale effect, you know, because people, you know, that was happening right then and there. Like and once again, a, a major imperial country was being knocked back on its so socks by what was supposedly a very primitive people. Like it was a, a great shock, you know, to the American people like that whenever um, the Battle of the Little Bighorn turned out the way that it did. I mean, they were playing a double header back in Chicago. The White Sox were playing a double header on the centennial, you know, the hundredth anniversary of the birth of the United States. Like and suddenly to find out that your, your, your army had just been whipped, you know, out there on the plains, you know, of Eastern Montana, it was a little bit of a shock like that. And, uh, and interesting too, in a number of different ways too. One of the ones that I like to point out to a lot of people since um, most people like to think of the Battle of the Little Bighorn as being something of a, of a battle, you know, that it was like two armies, you know, up against each other, you know, out there, you know, in, in this giant battlefield. And uh, I remember talking to Charles Little Old Man up on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation one time, and I made the mistake of saying that there weren't any survivors like that of the Little Bighorn. And he looked at me and goes, actually, Craig, there were thousands of survivors of the Little Bighorn. They just weren't white. And so uh, I, I got knocked back on my heels on that one like that. And, uh, and he provided like an awful lot of really wonderful insights. You know, uh, Charles was actually the basis for Lonnie Littleberg um, in the books. And he actually comes back, you know, in, the, in, full, in fine fettle like that in the, the next to last stand. Um, another question I've been asked, like that, wasn't this, wasn't this used as a, a plot point in one of the episodes um, in the first season of Longmire? In all actuality, it was. Like that, I was actually talking to the producers and telling them, you know, about this book. This was, you know, what would that have been? That would have been almost 10 years ago, like that, which kind of gives you an indication of how long it takes me, you know, to, to get enough research done to where I feel satisfied and comfortable enough, you know, to actually sit down and write a book, especially a book that's, you know, that's, that's dealing with, you know, a social issue, like an historical issue, like it is as grand, you know, as the Little Bighorn. Um, 
but I told them about it. I told them about the painting. I told them about all of that, like that. And uh, they actually used it, you know, in one of the episodes. It was kind of funny though, like that, because the way that they had it portrayed was, is it was the original painting, but the painting was only like about four feet by three feet, like that. So, I mean, it was a smaller screen. So I guess they decided they were going to make the painting um, a little bit smaller, I guess. Like that. But uh, anyway, like that, it actually, you know, did make an appearance like in the television show. It just took, took a, a kind of a different route like that. And uh, so then, you know, when it, and then when the big thing was, is like finding a way for Walt to be involved. And whenever I thought out, you know, you know what, the guys, the veterans up there at the, the soldier's home, that would probably be the place to have this all kind of, kind of take place. It kind of worked for me. Like, in a, um, Let's see, like, let's, I mean, I'm looking down the signs here. Like somebody's asking me about my writing process, like and my writing routine. Um, well, you know, after hearing me talk, you know, for more than a half an hour, you probably figured out, like, I, I, I don't have any routine, like, and, you know, any plan, like, about what it is I'm doing. That's not true. I have to admit that I, I uh, very, very carefully um, sit down and outline all of my books. You know, I, I feel that, like, what I do is, you know, kind of socially responsible crime fiction. I mean, I'm not just trying to, you know, stack up bodies like cordwood. You know, I'm always trying to have something to say. And, um, with all of the marvelous books that have come out um, about the Little Bighorn as of late, you know, um, Nathaniel Philbrick's book, The Last Stand, is really an amazing one. Um, and a number of others, James Welch on Killing Custer. Um, there are a lot of native voices that came out, um, some that I had to dig for a little bit. Some were like oral histories um, that had been, you know, uh, recorded um, in anthologies like that, that were like, you know, uh, close to 100 years old. Um, but they were very, very interesting and very heartfelt simply because they give you a very different perspective on the Little Bighorn than the one that, you know, was basically the, 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 the company line like that that we got for an awful long period of time due to one person, I have to also admit, Libby Custer, um, George Armstrong Custer's wife. Um, was a firebrand as far as like trying to make sure that her husband was remembered as you know a golden hallmark of heroic virtue like that uh, for better or worse like that and uh, and so you know to hear more of you know what the the native perspective was on the battle um, it was kind of interesting to me like and as I was talking before like that you know talking about the two uh, armies you know, out there, you know, on the plains, like out of the Little Bighorns, where the, the rivers, you know, kind of uh, joined together. Um, it really wasn't. It really wasn't two armies. Like, it, it was one army attacking a nomadic people. Um, the Cheyenne and the Sioux uh, had a very, very large encampment there at that one point in time, which you would think, you know, obviously would give them a great advantage of numbers like that. But you have to also take into consideration that an awful large percentage of the, the, the individuals that were there were the children, were the elderly. Um, the, I mean, it, it, was, it was a movable city is what it was. Like, and so you have to think about what a disadvantage it would be that if you were being attacked that you had to try and, you know, protect, you know, the, the, your families, like, you know, both the aged and the young, children, everyone, like that. And, and that's kind of a double-edged sword, like that, because it does put you at something of a disadvantage um, in that defense, like, you know, because, you know, you're, you kind of got it all on the line. The other thing is, is that you've kind of got it all on the line. You're fighting for your survival. You're fighting for your children. You're fighting for um, the elderly, all of the things that are important to you. And that can become a very formidable fighting force, um, which is something that the 7th Cavalry and uh, George Armstrong, Custer, and Ben Teen, and, and uh, Reno all kind of discovered when they split up their forces into three parts. Um, it made for, a, you know, a, a, a quite a delicate battle. Like that, you know, maybe was, as I said, something of a little bit of a surprise um, to the rest of the country. Um, Let's see, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to work my way through, look at there, there are more than I can get, you know, to as quickly as I can. I'm trying to, to go uh, down here. Uh, let's see. It's, it, thank you for the absolutely wonderful um, remarks. Oh, there's one. Like, do you see Custer as a hero or a villain? Um, it's a very good question. Like, a very, very interesting question. Um, he, there were, it was obviously a very complex individual. Like that, and um, at that point in time, he was maybe even more complex than he normally was. Like at, um, he was under a lot of pressure at that point in time because he had made some very unflattering remarks about um, Ulysses S. Grant at that period in time was the, the president of the United States, had made some very unflattering remarks um, about Grant's brother. And um, he was kind of in the doghouse, you know, to a certain extent, you know, trying to, at the very waning days of the American Indian Wars, uh, to try and get out of the doghouse. And some say that he was actually also attempting to try and uh, mount a campaign 
um, for a possibility of you know being able to run for you know, president of the United States. And so there were a lot of complexities involved in what it was that he was involved with, you know, with this campaign with the Seventh Cavalry at that period in time. Um, one can't help but think, you know, when you start going through the history, of course, like a, that, you know, that, uh, you know, th to try and put a 20th, you know, 20s, you know, 21st century um, perspective, you know, on a situation that happened in, uh, in uh, 1876, like it is always, you know, uh, the, the bitter gift of hindsight like that. But um, I, I'm not going to answer that question. I think, you know, I'm probably what I'm going to do is allow you to read the book. Um, there's a, I don't want to give too much away from the book like that, but as you might, might well imagine, like that, there's a conversation as Walt and Henry and Vic are sitting at the Red Pony Bar and Grill um, watching a really, really terrible um, Custer movie. Like, and uh, Vic makes the mistake of asking the question of what really happened to the Little Bighorn. And uh, Walt, of course, gives us, you know, the more, you know, tried and true, this is how I was educated, this is what I was told in the schools, and all that, like, and then Henry um, gives us maybe a, a little bit more of what his perspective on uh, the Little Bighorn and Custer might be, like that, so it, it becomes a little bit more complex as things go on, and uh, as, hopefully I handled it, you know, with a, with a sense of humor, and hopefully you'll get as many laughs out of it um, as you do uh, as far as uh, the actual facts that you're going to get out of it, too. Um, let's see, what was my road to becoming a writer? Um, you know, I, I came from a family of storytellers. Uh, I, my, my mother was an absolutely magnificent storyteller. Like my father was a very good storyteller. Everybody in my family were really good storytellers, except for me. I wasn't particularly very good at it. And so um, I, uh, I, I figured, you know what, maybe if I can't tell them, maybe I could try writing them. And so I started writing them and, um, you know, it's kind of hit or miss like that. I mean, you know, wanting to be a writer is kind of like wanting to be an astronaut. Um, the chances, you know, the odds against you are so great uh, that you might as well just shut up and not tell anybody about it. That way, if it, it happens, it seems like a miracle overnight. And if it doesn't happen, then you don't make a fool out of yourself. So I, I didn't make a big deal out of telling people that I was a writer or, you know, that I was writing a book. Like that. But uh, the first book that I wrote um, was actually The Cold Dish, the very first Walt Longmire novel. And uh, I was fortunate enough to get picked up um, by probably one of the most powerful agents in New York and probably one of the most charming and wonderful human beings I know, uh, Gail Hockman. Uh, Brant Hockman Associates, and uh, thank goodness for me, she has a little bit of a weakness for cowboys, and uh, when I walked into her office there, you know, in New York, Times Square, I had my hat on, and I had my boots on, like that, and uh, told her about this sheriff of the least populated county in Wyoming, and uh, she actually took me on as a client, and then handed me over to uh, Catherine Court, who at that point in time was a senior editor at Viking, and uh, president at uh, Penguin, and uh, she's the one that sat me down, like it, and said, "Not only are we going to publish this book, but we'd like to to possibly, you know, maybe you know, see this as a series." And uh, I got to admit that it's that point in time that I, you know, without having had a single book published, you know, tried to argue with the president of Penguin and said, "Oh, I don't think that's a really good idea, but I've got some other ideas I want to bounce off of you." And she said, "Why don't you go back to Wyoming and sit down at your ranch and think about this?" And uh, and so I did. Look at I did think about it. You know, I thought, okay, well, you know. The first draft of the cold dish was about 650 pages long, so I had to cut about 250 some pages out of it. And so I thought, well, you know, you've lost a lot of stories there. You know, maybe you could use some of those later on down the road. And you know, maybe you want to know more about these characters. Well, now would be the chance for you to do it because nobody else is going to write it. And so that's when I decided, okay, well, maybe maybe Walt Longmire has a a future as a series like that. And uh, that was how it all kind of started for me. That was 17 years ago, and. I've been with Viking Penguin, like that, and it's a it's a pretty fantastic publisher to be with, and a wonderful group of people to work with. Seventeen years have gone by, and uh, I don't know. They tell me that that's a, a good sign in your life, like that, when it seems to be going way faster than you really want it to. If I could slow it down, I really would, but uh, I wouldn't change anything if I could. There's a question down here. Uh, where is Judy this, this weekend? <laughs> we haven't seen her. Uh, Judy is actually next door like that, um, because uh, she took the dog, uh, Annie, 
our dog with us like that. And she's over there with our daughter, Jessica, and our granddaughter, Lola. And they're watching me now uh, to make sure that I don't say anything incriminating about our family life or anything like that. But uh, they're, they're all safe and sound. I don't have them locked up in the basement or anything like that. And uh, we're having a marvelous time like that. It's, uh, it's great like that. And I, you know, it's a wonderful weekend like that. And I'd like to get out, but you know, we've got events, you know, just about every couple of hours like that. And then, you know, with some of the technical things and answers that my good friend, Paul, like that who's doing such a magnificent job with the technical aspects of, of our virtual Longmire days like that and uh, I can assure you with the assistance of Paul that we'll still be having um, some more of these virtual events you know coming up um, next year uh, for the 10th anniversary so for those of you who are watching you know for the first time like that it's uh, like I said it's been you know magnificent to, 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 to read your emails like that and hear your comments um, we should have been doing this 10 years ago like that I do apologize but we'll we'll kind of make up for it this year and try to have a little bit more next year I, hope, I promise like that but yeah judy's fine she's here I, I guarantee you i haven't done anything with her or anything like that so um let's see uh let's see uh let's see how did craig decide on how old walt would be in the novels that's kind of interesting like because i had to answer that question somebody was asking me about you know the um uh, the age of Walt, you know, was I, you know, concerned about the fact that Walt is um, a little bit older um, than he is, you know, uh, and maybe in the TV show, like that, or, or would I have liked to have gone back and would I have changed it, made Walt maybe younger? No, not really, like that. I, you know, I, I guess, you know, I'm, you know, kind of approaching Walt Longmire's age, like that, you know, little by little, like that, and uh, I kind of like that, you know, that, that kind of world-weary, you know, experience, you know, that Walt brings, you know, that kind of benevolence that he's, he's kind of seen it all and uh, knows it all like that and then still, you know, has a twinkle in his eye and still has a smile in the corner of his mouth like that whenever he's dealing with some of these complex issues that, you know, sheriffing kind of calls for. And, you know, the, the Vietnam War was a tragic kind of situation like that, you know, for a lot of individuals like that. And, uh, you know, I, I had, you know, family and friends like that who fought in Vietnam like that. And, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, that, that it was only fair like that, that they should have a, a protagonist like that that was, you know, in some ways, you know, kind of representative of them. Not that Walt was the first, but just a, another one that he, he dealt with the situations that he dealt with there in Vietnam, <coughs> excuse me, like that, and, um, and came through. Um, like a lot of guys did like that. And, uh, you know, a sadder but wiser kind of sheriff is the way I kind of look at him. The other thing that a lot of people don't take into consideration, maybe uh, that they don't notice like that, but I'm, I'm always happy to point out like that, that uh, my good friend, Tony Hillerman, um, actually gave me a really wonderful piece of advice. I just got finished doing an event um, with his lovely uh, daughter, Anne, um, for the Collected Works uh, bookstore down in Santa Fe, like that, which if you're in Santa Fe, do make sure to stop in sometime. It's a magnificent uh, bookstore. And um, anyway, uh, Tony's advice to me whenever I was talking, I think he was, he was like on his 20th the book when I was writing my first one or my second one and I asked him I said you know how do you do this you know how do you you know how do you you know uh you know how do you how do you try and you know do this like it seems difficult I mean I don't want to do the same thing over and over again you know so how do you how do you do this like and so he said well you got to try and find a structure to what it is that you're doing and uh you know I thought about it okay and I thought okay well as westerners you know what's the thing that probably has the largest scale effect you know, on us and, you know, being in, you know, the least populated state, uh, you know, in the United States, you know, and that would be the weather. Um, the weather has a large scale effect, you know, on us. Like, and, um, you know, there are an awful lot of times, you know, here, if you're out and about like that, you, you can't dodge into a building, you can't dodge into anywhere um, where there might be air conditioning or there might be heat or there might be all those things. And so you're a little bit more out there in the open. And so I thought, okay, well, then the seasons, you know, it seems to me like it should be the, you know, the format in which that I'm going to write the books. Okay. And so what I decided was, is like, you know, that also it gave me a different kind of environment for each book. Um, as everybody knows that's ever been to the American West, you know, Wyoming in July is nothing like January. And so, you know, for me, it kind of gave a different environment for each book, which was a fun thing to do like that. And so that makes an important point as whenever it is that I'm choosing, um, you know, what the, the time period for a book is going to be. Um, you know, because I don't want to write a rodeo book that's going to take place in the winter. But the great thing about it is, is that it takes me four books to get through one year of Walt's life. And so here we are like that, you know, um, yeah, I'm 17 years older than when I first met Walt. Um, but 
Walt's not 17 years older like that. And so if you do the math pretty quick, you can figure out you know, that Walt's only aged uh, a couple of years like that since we first met him uh, in the cold dish, which was the fall book. Um, and then Death, uh, Death, of a Winter, uh, uh, Death, Death Without Company uh, was the winter book. Okay. And then, um, let's see, Kindness Goes Unpunished was the third book. And Another Man's Moccasins was the summer book. And those four books comprised the first year of Walt's life. Like that. And so, uh, no, I'm kind of happy with Walt the age he is. I, I, I don't think I would change that. I, I, I think I like him the way he is. Um, let's see, some more questions are piling up here. Let's see. Uh, will we see more of Walt's backstory of his time outside of Wyoming, such as Alaska? Yes, you will. Uh, absolutely. I mean, one of my favorite things to do is like to circle back around, you know, and find periods in Walt's history um, that are uh, of great interest to me. Um, there are a couple of points. There's that point in Alaska um, where he was doing security on the oil rigs, uh, oil rigs um, after, war, uh, after uh, the Vietnam War. Um, there was also the period in time immediately following the war where he was shipped off to Johnston Atoll um, there in the middle of the Pacific Ocean all by himself. He had a couple more months left um, on his tour of duty as a Marine investigator, and uh, the, the provost marshal just wanted to get rid of him get him out of the way. And so they shipped him off to Johnston Atoll, this rock in the middle of the ocean. And uh, I've also been, I've, I've been fortunate enough like that to have uh, some marvelous uh, readers like at the military past like that, that you know, could give me information on Johnston Atoll that period in time. Like and a lot of other individuals that I've reached out to find out about, you know, that, that island at that specific period in time. And so those are all ones that I'm going to use. There's another one like that, that I'm dying to write. That's another little novella like that, that I discovered um, that the old, I don't know if, some people are not going to remember this, like, but you know, some people will. Like, there used to be an old movie star by the name of Robert Taylor, not the Robert Taylor that's the star of Longmire. Um, he's too young. I'll get, um, but actually, the old Robert Taylor, um, who did Ivanhoe and a number of westerns, did a lot of westerns. Like, but he actually had a cabin up above Buffalo in the Bighorn Mountains. Like, and I have a number of stories that I've gotten from the Johnson County Sheriff's Department of the adventures that they had when he lived here in the 1960s. And I thought, well, now, wouldn't it be interesting if Walt Longmire were to have a run-in, or at least a run-out, you know, with uh, the old Robert Taylor? Like, you know, Walt hasn't had any interactions with any movie stars or anything. And I thought, you know what, maybe that would be something. And so uh, that's another little novella that's probably going to be, you know, somewhere on the line uh, upcoming. Okay, so we do have that one to look forward to. I'm going to look down through here. Let's see. Um, Oh, that's an interesting. How do you keep track of the characters and plot lines in your books? Do you have it all in your head or do you have some kind of system? Um, you know, uh, there are two things I use. First of all, you know, when you spend so much time with the characters, it's almost like family members. And, you know, you, you remember all your family members and you remember all the stories and you remember all of the backstories, you know, that there are um that all of these characters have like it and so I'm, I'm able to stick a lot of it um in my head like that and hold on to it um but one thing i also do is, is i have this in incredible secret weapon called george guadel and what i do is i grab one of those george guadel you know packets of cds like that and you know one of the occupational hazards of living in wyoming on a ranch you know in a town of 25 is if you want to if you want a gallon of milk you're gonna have to drive 20 miles to get it like that so you do spend a certain amount of your time in vehicles like it and i'm telling you what one of the most magnificent things in the world is an audio book you know i've got tons of audio books that i you know break out and re-listen to over and over again and uh you know and it's very helpful to me like that because you know i can get my books out like that if i have a book that circles back around and has something to do either with a geographic area or with some characters that were involved with the previous book i can get that book out put it in the dvd or the cd player and listen to that book like at the one that i'm writing right now now um, is actually called, uh, it's the working title for the one that's like not coming out in September, but from full year away, um, it's called Daughter of the Morning Star. Like that. And a lot of it takes place almost exclusively up on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation and up near Hardin and in that area. And so the previous book that I wrote along those lines was one called uh, As the Crow Flies. And so there were a lot of really wonderful characters that I wanted to bring back. And since I hadn't visited them since the eighth book, you know, almost halfway back, you know, through my period as a novelist, 
I, I've had that one, you know, in my CD player and been listening to it, you know, to pick up some of the little details and some of the smaller characters that might have slipped through the cracks if I hadn't gone back um, and reread that book, you know, but, uh, you know, George always makes, you know, a, a joy, you know, uh, sitting down and rereading your own books. Sometimes that, that, that can be a joy like that. But, you know, I think we're all kind of hardwired uh, to enjoy being read to. I love being read to. I really, really do. One of the big parts of the process of um, of my uh, writing process is, uh, is to have Judy read back to me what it is I've written that day. I'll write again, and then I'll give Judy, you know, what I wrote that day, and she'll read it back to me. And um, it's kind of wonderful, like that, in a lot of different ways, like that. Because the biggest thing is, any mistakes you made will become glaringly obvious you'll hear them just plain as day, especially in dialogue. If you write bad dialogue, you'll hear it immediately. Um, but I can also tell you that like one of the most frightening terms, one of the most frightening phrases that you can hear um, um, whenever Judy is reading my books back to me is the phrase, is there another way to say this? Um, and that kind of hits kind of like right to the, the core of one of my um, firm beliefs, you know, in writing, you know, whenever I'm doing writing workshops, um, you know, I, I, I'm always telling students, if you write something and it sounds like something that you've read before, guess what you have? Um, go back and try and write it in a different way. The example that I always use is uh, the red hot gun barrel swung around under the looming mountain. You know, well, the, the, the gun barrel is always red hot. The mountains are always looming. You need to find a new way to say that, some way that will spark, you know, the reader's imagination, something that will catch their imagination. Your job is not to put the reader to sleep, like it, so that they fall asleep with the book on their chest. Your job is to keep them, you know, turning those pages to see what's going to happen, like it, or to be invested in those characters. That's where, you know, the real joy, you know, of, of being an author is kind of all about. Um, and so, you know, for me, I, I always dread whenever Judy says, is there another way to say this? It's, 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 it's utterly frightening, I have to admit. Um, let's see. Will the painting be available on a t-shirt? Probably not. Probably we won't be doing the t-shirt. Um, I think that some an ancillary rights, you know, still belong to Anheuser-Busch, and I'm not sure that they're willing to share that with us. Like that. And so um, probably we won't. Like that. Now, there is the Custer Museum, though, that's up here in Gary Owen that does have really magnificent prints, you know, that are available um, where you can actually get a print of the painting. And uh, you can see it yourself. Like it's, it's a, you know, much, much better um, than the ones that have been hanging on you know, bar walls for like 50 or 60 years. Um, the one that we do have out now, we have the virtual uh, Longmire Days t-shirt, which has the Bronco sitting on the side and uh, Robert um, sitting on top of the Bronco that's been wrecked. And uh, we were talking about that yesterday um, when we were having the happy hour at the Red Pony Bar and Grill where um, I accused Robert of doing a uh, method spit. I said it was a very Stanislavski spit that he did, you know, after he'd crashed his Bronco. He denies that and says that's not the case, like that, but I'm still not sure if that's really true or not. Like that. So let's see, let's go on down a little bit further. I've got enough time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, did you have a lot of input on who would be tapped to play the characters in the series, in the television show? Um, you know what? I, I, I did. I actually did. Like, I, I didn't have final say like that, you know, which, you know, trust me, you don't want a cowboy from a town of 25 telling you who you should cast in your TV show or in your movie. Um, you know, hopefully I would have better people to work with, you know, that, that would have better ideas than I would like that. But um, what's great is that uh, they really were very, very good. And then um, they were curious. They were curious as to what, you know, my thoughts were. Um, on the casting. Um, the, the, the big one, you know, for us was, of course, you know, Walt Longmire. That was the, the one we had to try and figure out, you know, who, uh, who would play Walt Longmire. As a matter of fact, um, when Warner Brothers was making it, you know, um, the network picked it up like that, but it was cast contingent. And what that meant was, is we'll do it, but you have to find a Walt Longmire that we all agree will be a good Walt Longmire. And um, it was pretty much a consensus all the way around. I mean, a lot of guys tried out for that role like that. But boy, you know, when, when Robert Taylor came in like that and gave his audition and, uh, you know, he was doing that, you know, that scene where he was, uh, you know, doing a, a notification of death where he's telling this woman where her husband is not going to be coming home. And he was the only one that took off his hat. <coughs> that was like, you know, pretty, pretty obvious for us that that was probably our guy right there.
Ah, excuse me. I have to take a drink of water. Like, how long did it take to write the new book? Um, this was a whopper. This one was, you know, this was a, this was a fight. You know, sometimes, you know, they just zoom right along. The one I'm working on now um, is zooming right along. Like, because I'm back up on the res um, and I'm there with Lonnie and Barrett Long and Lolo Long and, uh, you know, all of these fun characters like that that I haven't written about in a couple of years. And so I'm having a blast writing that one, and it's going very fast, like that, and, uh, you know, usually it's the ones that have to do, a, have a lot of research involved, like that one that I remember taking a long time to write, of course, was uh, Hell is Empty, um, because that one had so much to do with uh, Dante's Inferno, and whenever you compile, you know, and have so much research, um, or, you know, literary aspects that you have to use, um, it takes a while, it takes a while like that, and you have to be careful with that information and try and, you know, get it across as well as you can. And it just takes time to do it. There's no, no two ways about it. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. There's some more questions. Let's see. I've got time for, I think, I think I can squeeze one more in. I think we started at about a couple of minutes after like it. And so maybe I can squeeze one more in, into this. Let's see. Uh, a lot of people are writing and saying that they actually have this, they actually have the Budweiser painting um, in their garage, like in their, in their, in their rumpus room, like at or behind the, the, the house bar or whatever, like that. Um, and uh, let's see. Yeah, it's, uh, um, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, okay. Here, I'll, oh, no, here, here's a good question. Like, uh, tell us about the stunning white moccasins with the roses pinned to the, uh, the wooden post behind you. You can actually see a little bit, uh, this is my kitchen is what this is. Like, and um, uh, that's the spiral staircase uh, that's the handmade by a good friend of ours, like at uh, Glenn Hines, like at, who is a uh, sculptor out of Maine, who was here like that and uh, visiting me one time, like that and said, you know, what are you gonna do, you know, for those stairs? And I said, I don't know, build stairs. And he said, maybe I've got a better idea. And it was wonderful how he built those stairs, handmade, like at Lofted and did all the work for us. Like, at, and, and then I guess over, let's see which corner is, Oh, it's on this side. Like, okay, yeah, um, those are actually uh, a set of crow uh, moccasins. Like, and I, I'm pretty sure. I think that those were actually a gift from my good friend Marcus Red Thunder. Like, who's kind of the model for Henry um, in the books. Like, and um, you'll probably you'll if you haven't seen Marcus already, um, we had a really good time uh, earlier. You know, doing our Zoom call. Um, but then somebody broke the news to us that, you know, whenever we switched, you know, computers, um, that you're, when you do a Zoom call, you're supposed to be in different locations, okay? So we're still learning, and, you know, we're, I think we're doing better, you know, every time we do one of these. Um, but anyway, if you had a chance, like at Marcus, is absolutely magnificent, and such a, a delight, and such a good friend of mine, and such a, a source of so much, you know, in my life, like that. And uh, it was one of the benefits to have him, you know, be a much larger part um, of Longmire days, like that, that we got him to, uh, you know, be one of the, you know, the monitors, hall monitors, like that, for a number of uh, the events that we've got, like that, one of the hosts, like that, and uh, I believe he's doing one uh, with Lou Diamond Phillips, I believe, maybe that's the one that's later this evening, um, about the two Henrys, like that, you always get to see Robert Taylor and I do the two Waltz, like that, but uh, he also did one with Zahn, um, which I think is coming out, I think we're having some problems with some of the editing and process and getting it through, um, but we will, we'll win, we always do, like we have Paul on our side, like that, and he always makes things happen. Um, but anyway, like that, um, I guess I need to kind of wrap things up. Like that, and uh, I just want to thank everybody so much for being here. Um, this was this this was my first, you know, of, event um, for this book. Uh, this one won't start up, as we said, until uh, September twenty second. Um, be sure to go out. You can pre order the book. Um, there are a number of different places where you can do that. Besides, you can also order it. Um, from our website, craigallenjohn.com. Like, and uh, um, we'll, we'll be trying to personalize them wherever we go. And uh, if I don't get a chance to personalize your book, well, you can make sure um, that when I'm out on tour the next year, I'll be happy to sign two books for you rather than one. And uh, thank you guys so much for all the wonderful remarks and the emails and the commentary and all that. It really does make this so much worthwhile. Like that, um, whenever I sit down um, every day, uh, at, at, the, at that computer screen like that and enter Absaroka County and into that world. Um, I never do it alone. I never do it alone. I've always got you guys with me. And um, I'll tell you what, you're good company. Thanks so much.